Hey friends, it's Just The Gems, I'm Brandon. I've always been a big story guy. I can tolerate a lot of negatives in a game if there's a compelling story driving it. With that in mind, I figured it was high time I broke out my definitive spoiler-free list of the 10 best JRPG stories out there. Now, these are in no particular order. Well, I mean, they are, obviously. I put them in an order. This video isn't randomized for each viewer or anything. I guess what I mean is the order I put them in is in no way indicative of my feelings about their quality relative to any others. Okay, that's enough of that. But before we dive in, would you consider subscribing? It helps the channel out so much. And if you are in the mood to help me out, clicking like does a lot and it's so easy to do. Thank you so, so much. All right, on with the show. I know there's no real reason to think of handheld games as being in any way inherently lesser than console games, but ever since I was a kid, I've had a hard time thinking of handheld games as being on the same level as console games. It's gotten easier to do in more recent years, and now that the Switch has basically done away with the distinction, it's kind of a moot point. But all that to say, when Radiant Historia Perfect Chronology came out, I went in with expectations that were a bit lower than what this game deserved. Radiant Historia Perfect Chronology is the story of Stock, a secret agent for the kingdom of Alistel, who's sent on a mission that ends up throwing him into the middle of an enormous conflict between two warring nations. The world around them is slowly turning into a desert wasteland, and Alistel blames the opposing nation for causing this. It's a bad situation. Stock ends up receiving a book called The White Chronicle, which gives him the ability to alter time. This is a time travel story that handles things very differently from another prominent time travel JRPG that may or may not be included on this list. Don't look down on the timeline, that's cheating. But anyway, the time travel in Radiant Historia Perfect Chronology follows more of an alternate universe sort of path. After one crucial choice early in the story, the White Chronicle splits into two timelines, and Stock will have to jump back and forth between them, advancing along each timeline and gaining the ability to clear hurdles in one that he can use in the other. It's a remarkably effective storytelling device, and it ensures that there's more than enough drama to go around. Couple that with the fact that someone out there seems to have possession of a book called The Black Chronicle, and they're using it to cause even more problems, and you have a complicated story that younger me just never would have believed could possibly be on a handheld system. It's a massive shame that this game is locked on the 3DS, especially with the closure of the eShop, Radiant Historia Perfect Chronology is so much harder to play than it deserves to be. My recommendation is to track this one down any way you can. For JRPG story lovers, it is begging to be played. Final Fantasy VI wasn't the first JRPG released in America to have a compelling story. It wasn't even the first Final Fantasy to do that. But it was the first time that storytelling in an American released JRPG seemed to transcend its medium and achieve the level of complexity that you would find in a long-running drama or movie or book. It skipped most of the cliches that its competitors relied on back in the 90s and instead gave us a focused and complex story of empires, rebellion, and insanity. There there are even some incredibly heavy elements in this game that it's almost hard to believe made it past the overly sensitive US censors. This is an epic experience that is essential for JRPG fans to check out. Final Fantasy VI is the story of a huge group of characters, but primarily it's the story of Terra a girl who seems to possess magical powers. Now, in most JRPGs, that would just be something you'd shrug about and not give a second thought. But in the world of Final Fantasy VI, magic has long since been gone from the world. Her power makes her extremely valuable to the Empire, which uses its high technology to force Terra to do what they want. She escapes from their control and joins a rebellion, and that's when things really start to get interesting. This is a game that essentially takes place in two massive acts. The first act is a tightly paced narrative that follows Terra and her friends as they take on the Empire, and its epic climax definitely felt like the end of a game to me. But Teenage Brandon was blown away because once that second act gets started, I realized how far I had left to go. And it's in this second act that I got to experience non-linear storytelling for the first time. See, and without spoiling anything, the second half of the game opens up in a way no other JRPG ever had in my experience. And while there are some events that have to occur in a certain order, in large part you're free to experience the various story beats in a bunch of different orders. It's like the first act is an epic novel and the second act is an equally compelling book of short stories, all of which come together in the end to provide the perfect conclusion to the overall story. And when I say perfect, 
I mean it. I don't think any Final Fantasy game's ending has taken the crown from Final Fantasy VI, at least in my mind. This is a beautiful game, the crowning achievement of Final Fantasy in the 16-bit era, and fortunately it's so much easier to come by than the previous game in this list. If you haven't played it yet, you owe it to yourself to make it a priority. Omori is a challenging game on a lot of levels. In part, it has a super engaging combat system that uses emotions in a sort of rock, paper, scissors game to determine who has the advantage, and some of the tougher bosses can really give you a run for your money. But beyond that, it's challenging in some ways that the vast majority of video games just aren't. The story of Omori is beautiful and scary and emotional. It's haunting in more ways than one. But some of that beauty and fear and emotion carries with it a caveat. This game will be hard to stomach for some people. At its core, Omori is the story of a little boy named Omori who lives in a fantastical world full of personified objects with his friends. It's also the story of Sunny, a slightly older boy who lives in a small suburban town that's as normal as can be and hasn't left his house in years. If you're a weeb like me and you're thinking there might be some connection between Omori and Hikikomori, the Japanese term for a shut-in, then you're right. What becomes clear pretty early on is that something horrible happened to Sonny a few years ago and he's been holed up in his house with his fantasies about happier times. And as his friends in the real world start to try and gently push their way back into his life, he finally has an opportunity to come to terms with everything that hurt him. The dichotomy between the fantasy world and the real world is so stark you would be forgiven for just wanting to stay put in the fantasy world. After all, the story there is so fun and funny, full of crazy characters like Space Boyfriend and Brian the Distinguished. And there are stakes there, even if they aren't exactly life or death. But the real interesting stuff in my mind is what's happening in the real world. Every character in the fantasy has its own parallel in the real world, and learning about these characters and how Sunny sees them is amazing. There are different routes you can take through the game, some where Sunny can choose to remain inside, and others where he can attempt to reconnect with his former friends. While it's super interesting to see the different directions the story can go, my personal choice is seeing Sonny emerge from hiding and start to rebuild his life. Discovering the solution to the central mystery of the game remains this intriguing carrot that urges you on, but the interactions between the characters is what really elevates this game to masterpiece status. It's a truly beautiful experience, and if you're able to handle its more delicate themes, I think you'll really love it. Ease games have always been fast and breezy action RPGs with fun characters and challenging combat. They have not, in my opinion, always been the homes of the best stories. As I marathoned my way through the entire series a couple of years ago, that made this super clear to me. And it made East 8, Lacrimosa of Donna, all the more impressive because of it. East 8 once again follows Adol and Dogi, two adventurers with a penchant for getting shipwrecked, as they once again throw caution to the wind and board a ship, only to find themselves stranded on an island with a ton of other castaways. This reveals one of the biggest strengths of East 8 compared to its predecessors. There are so many interesting characters in this game. Even beyond your party members, which are some of the best in the entire series, the supporting cast of castaways... Supporting castaways? Yeah, that's good. The supporting castaways do so much to bring life and energy to the story. Speaking of story, which... We are, that's what the video is about. But the story is fantastic. It marks the first time that I really felt engaged with an East story, other than maybe East Origins, but the story in East 8 is far grander in scope than Origins ever could be. See, this island they're stuck on is pretty special and may have been home to an ancient race of beings who, look, I'm avoiding spoilers here, but let's just say that our hero Adol develops something of a psychic connection with someone from the distant past, and naturally the plot that develops from this involves the fate of the future. With a strong cast of characters, a bunch of beautiful locations, music that's to die for, top tier combat, and a story that will do far more than just keep you playing like the previous entries, I cannot recommend East 8 enough. If you're intimidated by the size of this series and you're afraid to dive in, you should feel free to grab East 8 and give it a try. Each story is self-contained, so you're not going to be missing anything important. In any way, the chronology of the games is all over the place anyway. But give this one a try. It's a breath of fresh air.
I've said a lot about the Trails series on this channel, and I will continue to say more about it because I love it. It manages to feel both as inscrutable as a long-running series of high fantasy novels and as approachable as any colorful anime JRPG. It's as trope-heavy as any modern anime, but it also breaks ground with its subtle and meaningful portrayal of some incredibly dark themes. In a word, the Trail series is amazing. It began back in 2004 with Trails in the Sky, and unlike most long-running series, it has maintained a continuous narrative for that entire time. While every few games the location changes along with the primary cast of characters, there's such strong continuity here, not just in terms of major characters and story beats, but even in terms of minor NPCs. Each arc of the story follows a fairly similar pattern as far as structure goes. The first game is sort of a foundation story where characters are introduced, the world is explored, and by the end, the stakes for what's to come are well established. It's then followed up with an execution story where all the plot seeds that were sown in the previous entry begin to blossom and extremely consequential things begin to happen. There are occasional breaks in that rhythm, for example Trails in the Sky the Third, which goes in a completely different direction, or the fact that the foundation execution pattern happens twice in the Trails of Cold Steel arc, but by and large, this serves the story well. By giving us a strong foundation for each arc right up front, we don't have to spend time on those foundational things when the action gets going. You can easily think of each arc as one very long game if it helps. Or, if you're a maniac like me, you could even think of the entire series as one extremely long game. But to each their own. For the uninitiated, the Trail series is the story of the continent of Zemuria, which is made up of a bunch of different countries, from tiny monarchies to giant empires to corrupt democracies. Each arc takes place in a different one of these nations, and a good bit of the macro story involves the geopolitical situation that they all find themselves in. Now, if you're like me and don't exactly find political intrigue to be all that engaging in a JRPG, then rest assured, this is background. The real story is what's happening to your characters day to day. Whether you're taking on the role of a mercenary bracer as Estelle, or a police detective as Lloyd, or a student as Reen, you're thrown into situation after situation in which you have to face seemingly insurmountable odds. Add to that the mysterious society of Ouroboros that operates in the shadows and seems to have its hands in just about every major event that's happening on the continent, and you get a world that is basically a powder keg waiting to explode. I understand how big of an investment it must seem to even consider jumping into the Trail series at this point. But look, to paraphrase some investment advice I once heard, the best day to start the Trail series was yesterday. The second best day to start the Trail series is today. There's no rush, just jump on board, give them a try, and I think you'll find you just can't stop. The gulf between my expectations about a game and my actual experience with a game have never been greater than with Harvestella. What I mean is, when I learned about this game through that one Nintendo Direct, I thought, yawn. A farming sim with fantasy combat. How unique. How interesting. That's never been done before. But then I played it and I was immediately proven wrong. From the get-go, the art design and music drew me in. That alone might have been enough to get me to play the entire game. Fortunately though, there was even more waiting for me. This game begins throwing twists at you from the very beginning, and it pretty much never stops. So many crazy things are happening in Harvestella that it's sort of challenging to even define it in a genre of storytelling for risk of spoiling things. Suffice it to say, my initial classification of it as a fantasy story is very quickly and powerfully disproven. Since Harvestella is saddled with a silent protagonist, the onus falls on the supporting cast to provide all the development and interaction I demand in my JRPG stories, and this cast really delivers. They come from diverse backgrounds and naturally have a wide variety of combat skills, but even more interesting to me is the different worldview that each character brings. The set of circumstances you find yourself in, and again, I'm really avoiding spoilers here, so forgive the vagueness. I mean, let's just say that they all have a lot of reason to be upset, but each character responds so realistically and in a way that really fits with who you've come to know them to be. Here's a sort of summary so you can get a general sense for what the game's about. You are an amnesiac who finds yourself waking up in the middle of the road on a day known as Quietus. Quietus, you quickly learn, is this mysterious period that occurs between seasons. It's a sort of non-season in a way. It causes crops to wither and die, and everyone is sure to stay indoors for fear of catching a horrible and deadly disease that is only contractible on this particular day. For some reason, though, you seem to be immune. Which is good, because if you just had to, like, hang around inside all day, 
that wouldn't make for super compelling gameplay. At least not if it's anything like 2020 was. That was a drag. But anyway, the mystery of Quietus seems to be tied to the sea slight, which are these giant crystals that sort of power each of the four seasons. Something is going wrong with the sea slight, and so you set out to learn what's happening to them. Because if you can't fix it, there's a very good chance the entire world is doomed. This is a game that is dripping with atmosphere and beauty around every corner. I can't imagine not being charmed by the art design and the music and the characters. It ticks basically every box that I have to determine what is a great game and a great story. I'm glad I didn't listen to my doubts on this one or I would have missed out on what has become one of my favorite games of all time. Never again will we see a Final Fantasy world as richly detailed as the one in Final Fantasy VII. To be fair, that's because it had a massive advantage over other games in the series. Multiple games, movies, books, so much lore has been written into this world that it would require a multi-year and multi-million dollar investment from Square Enix to catch any of the other Final Fantasies up. Does that put it at an unfair advantage over most JRPGs? Well, sure. But who said this has to be a fair fight? Final Fantasy VII tells the story of Cloud Strife, a young guy who seems like he's been through some stuff. He carries around a giant compensation, I mean sword, sword. At the request of an old friend, he ends up joining an eco-terrorist organization whose goal is to bomb Mako reactors. Mako is the lifeblood of the planet and the evil corporation Shinra is sucking it all up to power hair dryers and massage chairs and like lights and stuff. Along the way, he and his friends learn all about his past and his connection to the great warrior Sephiroth, who was supposed to have been killed in action years ago. If you take a step back from the Mothership game, though, a broader universe comes into focus, and this is where Final Fantasy VII's storytelling evolves into something no other JRPG has been able to match. There are prequel games that tell the story of barely seen characters, including one whose incredible importance to the main game seems smaller due to his ridiculously short screen time. There's a sequel game that follows the fan favorite vampire dude with guns. There's a sequel movie, and like most everything Square Enix put out at the time, it was all about staying of the art flashy CG graphics and action. And there are even books, notably On the Way to a Smile, The Kids Are Alright, and Traces of Two Pasts, all by Final Fantasy VII scenario writer Kazushige Nojima. So these are canon, and the revelations they bring about the characters in the world contribute so much to the overall story. And then we come to the remake trilogy. Originally billed as a full-on remake of Final Fantasy VII, it pretty quickly reveals itself to be something quite a bit more than that. And that came as a surprise to everyone. A pleasant one for most, and a decidedly bitter one for some others. Whether the remake trilogy is a sequel to the original or some sort of alternate timeline shenanigans, it's the closest thing I've seen to a real prestige JRPG. When I say prestige, think games like The Last of Us, things of that nature. High caliber storytelling and gameplay in a beyond next gen sort of visual gloriousness. Final Fantasy VII has fought with VI for the top spot in my mind for years. Final Fantasy VI was so formative for me, but at least at the moment, my love for the characters and world of Final Fantasy VII have given it the top spot in the list of Final Fantasies. If you've somehow managed to avoid the hype train for this game altogether, I encourage you to give it a try. Undertale is compared often to games like Earthbound, a JRPG that dared to buck the high fantasy trend and set its story in a modern world. And not just that, but to tell a heartwarming story packed with quirky characters and comedy. In a sense, I guess that's a fair comparison. Undertale doesn't exactly exude a modern aesthetic, given that it takes place in an underground world populated with monsters, but it's a far cry from a standard sword and sorcery game, and it definitely achieves Earthbound's standard for quirky characters and comedy. But it does something else similar to that SNES classic too, something that's beneath the surface and harder to define. But here I go, trying to define it. In the world of Undertale, all the monsters were banished to this underground kingdom. You play as a little nameless kid who falls by accident into the monster's world, and you have to journey through it to return home. This simple premise, and honestly, beat for beat, the story itself is relatively simple too, but it manages to to dig down into emotional depths that you would never expect it could reach. The issue I'm having in describing it is, I don't know how to prove that to you without significantly spoiling the plot. But look, I'm committed to keeping this spoiler free, so I'll just do my best. Ganbarimas, as my fellow weebs might say. Undertale is really a story of deep and personal loss, and it's a story of forgiveness. 
A lot has already been said about the paths you can take through the game. There's the route where you kill every single monster, or the route where you kill some and spare some, and the route where you go full on pacifist and don't kill a single thing. These routes gamify the point that the creator, Toby Fox, is trying to make. The path of nonviolence is actually the only real way to achieve true happiness and peace, and so the true ending is locked behind this. And playing as a pacifist means this game might be pretty challenging. After all, if you're sparing every single monster along the way, you're not gaining experience points and you're not leveling up. This means you're going to have to face the final boss at level 1. To the grinders out there, this has got to sound pretty terrifying. But again, the gameplay itself is helping to tell the story here. Pacifism isn't easy. It's actually the hardest path through the game and through life. But again, it's the only way to achieve real happiness. Sure, it's full of goofy skeletons named after font stylings, and it has some very good doggos you can interact with, but that's just set dressing. The depth of feeling that's etched into every moment of this story is so strong that I don't think it will ever leave my mind. Undertale is a masterpiece. Chrono Trigger is an amazing story, not just because of its intriguing plot and its extremely memorable characters, those are big parts of it for sure, but I think one of the biggest and most often overlooked things about Chrono Trigger is its pacing. This is a game that starts you out with the lowest of low stakes. You, as Chrono, the Goku stand-in with a samurai sword, need to go to the Millennial Fair. While there, you have a meet-cute with Marl, a girl who seems a little bit shifty, if I'm being honest. And then, through a carnival sideshow gone awry, you end up traveling 400 years into the past. Even then, the goals you're tasked with are not the stuff of epic fantasy stories. You need to save Marl, and get home. But as you move along, the story begins unfolding, slowly at first, and then quicker and quicker, until suddenly you find yourself in a battle for the future of humanity. This expertly paced escalation is huge. It makes the plot so much more engaging than if we were hand-delivered the goal earlier on and always had that facing us on the horizon. I've already mentioned the characters in passing, but let's spend a little more time on them. These are some of my all-time favorite people in a video game, ever. Few games have the sheer variety of this ragtag collection of heroes. Silent Swordsman is a given, and you might even call the brash tomboy of a princess a trope as well. But the nerdy lady inventor, the big humanoid robot, the cave woman, and the frog man? Taken out of context, a lot of these characters could give you the impression this game is some kind of wacky parody of a JRPG. But while Chrono Trigger is full of funny moments, it plays it all straight and manages to give gravitas to even the cave woman's stilted dialogue. Going with these characters on this quest, leaping through time and making people's lives better in every era, it's just beautiful. It's fun and thrilling and fulfilling. Now look, I'm trying hard to separate myself from the decades of nostalgia I feel for this game. That stuff compounds like interest. Each new year brings even more nostalgia, and every time I replay it, I'm reminded of all the things I love about it. So sure, I guess it's fair to tell you to take what I have to say with a grain of salt. If you've never played Chrono Trigger, will you have the same experience I'm describing right now? Maybe not. Maybe my experience is buried beneath so many layers of memories that it's become fossilized, preserved forever in my mind this one specific way, and even if you were to dig it up and look at it, you probably couldn't fully appreciate it exactly the way I do. But that's okay. Great games mean different things to different people. I hope, if you haven't played Chrono Trigger yet, that you give it a shot. I think you'll have a great experience, even if it's not supported by all the years of nostalgia mine is. There is something distinctly 90s about Xenogears. I think it's the combination of giant robots and weird religious iconography and Jungian philosophy. I don't know if there were a ton of examples of those unique flavors intermingling during that decade, but I can tell you I was a giant Neon Genesis Evangelion fan. Maybe Tetsuya Takahashi was too. Xenogears is the story of Fei Fong Wong, a martial artist with amnesia and a giant robot with a power he can barely control. It's full of references to various religions that at one time made it seem extremely unlikely to ever be localized in the West. It's one of the most confusing plots in video game history. It's long and involved, and its final act feels like it's been pieced together with scotch tape. But man, I love the story in Xenogears. Maybe this hit at the perfect time for me, I don't know. The late 90s was when I was fully growing out of my awkward childhood years and into my awkward teen years, and the story of Xenogears continued to resonate with me long into my awkward adult years. See, I was a good kid. I grew up doing what I was told. 
Thematically, you could call Xenogears a story about questioning authority, about not blindly following leaders just because they tell you they've got your best interests in mind. Whether that's a government leader, a church leader, or someone else you look up to, it's important to think for yourself and scrutinize any belief system to make sure it holds up. And Xenogears gives you plenty of reasons why that's a good idea. But that description, even though it's accurate, it just drastically undersells all the craziness in this game. Set against a backdrop of war between two huge nations, Faye's story takes him across the world, all the while gathering allies to help him resist the mysterious country in the sky that seems to be orchestrating all the conflict below. This is one of the darkest and heaviest JRPGs ever made. It doesn't shy away from tough themes. That being said, it also features a character named Hammer who says stuff like this, so it's not all dark and dreary. Play this game any way you can. There's a past ROM you can play on PC that fixes up some of the original game's unfortunate quirks, but sitting down with a PlayStation controller in front of the TV is still a fantastic way to experience this. It's not gonna be for everyone, but story freaks like me will find so much to love. Well, that's it. What did you think? Tell me if you agree with my picks in the comments below, and let me know if there are any games that you'd put on a list like this. If you'd consider liking and subscribing to help out the channel, I'd greatly appreciate it. I'm really so grateful for you all that keep coming back to watch my videos. It means so much to me. Anyway, until next time. Bye.